great pleasure and a real honour to be here. It's, um, I, I thank the Big History Institute and, and Macquarie University for making it possible to be here at this amazing conference. The future always occurs on the last day of a conference, unless it's a futures conference. And so pretty much everything I've said, I'm, I'm going to say, I've already written has, and has already been covered in the conference today. So this is, whether this is, means that I'm intuitively good at my job or just suffering from incredible bad luck, anyway, we'll see. So it might seem a little odd that a futurist is speaking at a big history uh, institute conference, but the Anthropocene is actually where big history and the big future meet. It's where our increasing agency as a species over historical time has finally bumped up against and impacted the limits of the biosphere that not only gave birth to us, but also sustains us. How we find our way through these dangerous times has implications for all the generations that come after us. The fate of all posterity is up to us. So, no pressure. So futurists try to generate insights into the futures that might, lay, that might lie ahead in order to try to uh, navigate them as judiciously as possible, and that for humanity to navigate them as judiciously as possible. So today I'd like to share a, a few ideas and some frameworks that I hope might be useful. So big history is our storyline. It's our trajectory through the unfolding processes of cosmic evolution that lead from quarks to consciousness. In our case, from the Big Bang to our global civilization. It's the only instance of this process that we're aware of, but it's possible to imagine and even hope that it might have happened elsewhere too. So Carl Sagan famously said, we are star stuff, but he also said that we are a way for the cosmos to know itself. So with the emergence of humanity, the cosmos not only became aware of its own past and history, it also became possible for it to imagine its many possible futures. We are the place where information from the past and anticipations from the future meet. So the question I want to deal with first is, what futures may lie ahead for our global civilization? Well, the foundational axiom of future studies is the future is not predetermined, inevitable, or fixed. It's open. Therefore, there is no such thing as the future, singular. Rather, there are many alternative potential futures, plural, and therefore, the future cannot be predicted. So, you know, serious futurists are not in the business of attempting to predict the future. It's a losing game, and they know it. Rather, the very fact that it can't be predicted and is undetermined means that we can actually shape it to some degree. And, but the longer we leave things, the less wriggle room we end up with. So let us attempt to shape it as wisely as we can. Well, how would you do that? You would try to use a systematic and disciplined framework for doing so. Here's one I prepared earlier. So the generic foresight process was developed in order to produce this idea of trying to think seriously and in a disciplined manner about the future. It has a number of phases. Um, it's basically an input-output model. Um, in the inputs phase, you're concerned with information sources. You're, you're gathering information from a wide variety of sources and you're asking questions, how good are they? How reliable are they? How diverse are they? Essentially, you're looking for evidence of possible futures in the present. We analyse this and categorise it. We try to interpret this um, using various frameworks. And the term you won't recognise is prospection. That means purposefully thinking about the future in order to generate insights uh, or ideas about or images of, in the jargon of my field, the future. So these images and ideas feed into the sorts of options that come out of that and those then feed into the broader processes of strategy development or policy planning from the individual to the global level and possibly even beyond. The idea is for this to be totally scalable. It looks like a linear process. Believe me, it's not, but I leave the arrows off because people will freak out. Um, but you get this overall sense that there's a flow through this that gives rise to um, a process that can be repeated. There's lots of methods. You may recognise some of these Delphi uh, panels in the inputs, trend in, trends in the analysis phase, scenarios in the prospection phase. But ultimately, you choose the methods that are appropriate to the futures assessment that you are using. You know, with, if you've only got a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So 
the idea here is to craft the intervention in a way that makes sense to the, to the uh, context. One way of doing that is conducting what I've developed as layered analysis. I'll talk more about it a bit later. But for the, for the, the next bit, I want to talk about images or ideas about the future and how it's possible to think about them. Now, the future doesn't exist. So that means, and of course, I, I cannot prove that. It's, it's an axiom. Um, but everything that exists beyond the present moment is a potential future. These are all going to start with P, so it'll be really easy to remember them. The simplest one, of course, is the projected future, and this is the baseline extrapolation of dynamics from the past through the present and into the future. This is, you know, business as usual, um, or the baseline case generally. It's very, very easy to, to figure this out. More broadly, futurists talk about probable futures, and these are futures that we think are likely to happen, and they're generally based on current trends. So there's generally some sort of information or, or data that you can use to do time series. It's better than simply projecting, but it's still not so broad. So more broadly still, are plausible futures, which we think could happen based on our current knowledge of how things operate. So they don't contravene the laws of physics, they don't contravene the way that economic systems are assumed to work or political systems or what have you. But more broadly still are the possible futures which we think might happen, but they're based on some future knowledge that we do not yet possess. So designer people based on gene editing, maybe so. My favourite, of course, is the warp drive from Star Trek. And because I come from general relativity, I can tell you there is actually work going on about how you, uh, you know, cook up such a thing. Um, more broadly is the, the, the somewhat different class of futures called preferable futures. And these, in contrast to the others, are based on value judgments. So these are quite difficult to, to facilitate in large groups because, of course, what's preferred depends very much on who's doing the preferring. Uh, but these are based on value judgments about what we think should happen or ought to happen. And there is, of course, the converse of that, which is futures to avoid, undesirable futures. And the, the Paris meeting is about you know, avoiding some undesirable futures. But I've found that probably the most important class of all are the preposterous futures. Because these are the ones that we think that will never happen, that's impossible. And the reason this is important is because if you have this response to an idea about the future, what it generally means is that you've found that boundary of your thinking. Some unspoken or un unexamined assumption has been crossed, and so it's useful to reflect, well, what assumption is that, and does that continue to hold? So these are classifications about ideas about the future. The American futurist Jim Data uh, over many decades of work has observed that when he's asked people to think about the future of human society, that all ideas could be classified into one of these four archetypes. I didn't believe this when I first saw it, but I've yet to find a counterexample after many years of searching. So we can use these to examine, you know, the, the sort of archetypal futures that lie ahead. The most obvious is continuation. The current historical trajectory continues, and this is usually conceived of in modern times as continued economic growth, right? Growth is good. The flip side, of course, is collapse, where there's some breakdown of the social order due to one of a number of possible factors. There's war, there's an asteroid impact, there's environmental overload, or what have you, you know, basically, things go to hell. And for some people, these are the only two options. So they imagine that if there's no growth, there must be collapse. That's not very sophisticated thinking, so there is a more nuanced um, pair of, of um, archetypes. The disciplined society archetype sees society organised around some sort of overarching set of values, wherever they come from, whether from a deity, whether you know, environmental, whether ideological, whatever. And the last one is the transformational society which sees the end of, of current forms replaced by entirely new forms of behaviour, belief, norms, organisation, new life forms, sometimes there's aliens in there. Um, and the two main sub-variants of this are the high tech or the technological transformation and the high spirit or the spiritual consciousness transformation. And there's an intriguing hybrid of these two, which is when consciousness meets technology, you have the transhumanist, post-humanist and the singularity group, and I think Elise is going to talk about that in the next talk. 
So these four archetypes can be used to examine not only the future of human society, but the, the, the future of any aspect of human society. So they're a useful tool for interrogating that. Now, I want to talk about interpretation quickly because the types of futures you can imagine depend very much on the frameworks or the context that you choose to, to, to use. So this is a very complicated diagram, but it gives the sense of the sorts of things that we can think through, ranging from the very shallow, the patterns and trends and the pop futurism that's endemic in a lot of ma magazines, down through system drivers where, where policy analysis happens that's much more um, uh, hard working. Uh, but then you come into the worldview level, the, the mental models that we hold, the beliefs that we have, the perspectives that we take, the discourses that dominate the discussion around the social creation of reality. Um, so is economics privileged? Is environment privileged? And these then go down to even deeper levels of social, historical, macro-historical change. The worldview and historical levels are quite closely tied. They're not really as separate because our worldviews are shaped by the historical times we find ourselves in, but we can also shape history. So this is a, a quite a cup, tightly coupled system. You can extend this. You can extend this down through multiple layers. I see big history as our example of a more broader set that includes SETI, which is part of a more broader set that includes life, which is part of the broadest set, which includes cosmic evolution. So I see these as nested contexts. So given that we're thinking about the future of our civilization, if we choose big history as our frame of reference, let's see what futures are implied by this. Well, we've seen David's eight threshold model of, of increasing material energy complexity. We've landed here in the Anthropocene. And as a futurist, of course, I'm interested in what lies beyond today. Uh, and specifically, the, over the last several years, since I actually first saw this framework, the first thing I thought of was, well, I wonder what threshold nine looks like. So you th the, the, the future grows out of the present, so let's understand where we are. Václav Schmil. Um, has observed that we are living in a fossil fueled civilization, that basically modernity has been built on you know, the, the, the fuel derived from the dead bodies of, of animals that lived hundreds of millions of years ago. The, the current question, of course, is what comes after fossil fueled civilization? So, this is how I define threshold nine. I define it by analogy to threshold eight. If threshold eight was a transition to fossil fuels, then threshold nine will be the transition away from fossil fuels when they're no longer the dominant energy source powering our civilization. Now, other definitions are possible. We could tinker with our genetics and that would represent a different threshold moment. Um, but I want to focus on the energy question because basically I'm a physicist and energy is the ultimate currency of the universe. You don't got energy, you don't got anything. So let's think about that. Let's, so let's think about the, the question of the energy source powering our civilization through these four archetypes. Well, is it likely to continue? No. I actually had a ba bow noise for this, but I, I turned it down because I didn't want to risk blowing up the speakers. Um, essentially, we know from a big history perspective that oil and more generally fossil fuels are entirely transient. They are but a blip. Uh, and in fact, there's uh, work to suggest that we're actually over the, the hill and now it's all downhill. It's getting harder and harder to recover energy. The energy return on the energy invested is declining, so you get less back for more effort, basically. And so on the long, big history view, this, this goes away. Uh, and besides, climate change. We shouldn't burn it anyway. So even if we could pull out every last drop, which is not possible, um, we probably shouldn't do it. So this has led many people to say, well, what we really need is a new energy bonanza. Uh, here, symbolised by fusion power, um, although you can choose your favourite energy source, you know, whether it's miraculous, such as tapping the vacuum energy or what have you. Uh, a less radical view is that we should actually make the full transition to renewables. And that's a highly attractive idea. The thing that's often not thought about here, though, is that the energy density of renewable energy is much lower than that of fossil fuels. So you need a much larger collecting area to get the same that you'll get out of a single hole in the ground. So 
that's often not thought about. And this means that we may well find uh, that, that we cannot continue to live in the, the sort of the profligate waste of energy that we've become accustomed to over the last few centuries. So this has led to the idea that maybe we need to voluntarily simplify. Um, and so this represents a, a consciousness transformation as opposed to a technological one. Uh, that we should scale back, that we should do, you know, do with less and you know, reduce our impact. There are those who say, yeah, right, how good have we ever been at changing our behaviour? We would much rather change the world. So there is the whole discussion around geoengineering, whether it's you know, uh, um, less risky or more risky, and there are attendant risks and, and possible benefits that which uh, David Kay spoke about earlier. I look upon geoengineering as Anthropocene squared. This is part of you know, David G's view that, um, and I'm not a David, so there you go, I'm the only Joseph here, so that's, I'm fortunate in that regard. Uh, I see this as, you know, this is, this is cranking up the Anthropocene in precisely that way. Now, of course, we could get it seriously wrong. What can we learn from the collapse archetype? Well, apart from the usual suspects, which is we do something unbelievably stupid or we're incredibly unlucky, um, there's no society left to power. So extinction level events actually are not that useful to think about powering your civilization if, if the, the context here is energy. But what we can learn from, the, from studying the collapse archetype is that um, we see historical collapses studied by people such as Tainter and Diamond from a very foreshortened perspective. It looks like it was quick, but to the people living through it, it was typically on the order of decades to centuries. And so the term collapse uh, implies this rapidness that may not be that useful as a mental model when we think about um, you know, our, our medium to longer term future. So a term that gets used a lot these days is descent. And there's a great deal of discussion around energy descent and preparing for descent. And those of you who flew here, you know, you know that the way we, we fly aeroplanes, you don't keep flying until you run out of fuel. That's collapse. You use the remaining fuel to bring you back down nice and gently in a controlled way. And so there is a view that says we should stop wasting fossil fuels entirely and dedicate their entire use to landing our civilization safely with the attendant um, infrastructure that we'll need that will have to last indefinitely because fossil fuels are only a blip. So our energy future is possibly one of these four archetypes. This is due to um, David Holmgren, one of the co-originators of permaculture. He lives not far from me, actually, because I live in Ballarat in Victoria, and he lives in Hepburn Springs, so that's just by the by. In the absence of new actual energy sources, as opposed to, you know, fingers crossed, hope, 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 we probably won't get the techno fantasy. Um, for another reason, because uh, whether you spend the energy renewably or not, there's a certain finite amount of energy you can pump into the Earth system before there's a thermodynamic disequilibrium. It still needs to go somewhere. So we might not be able to, to keep adding energy to the system. If we're not able to concentrate the diffuse sources of, of renewable energy, we might not even manage to get green tech stability, which would be a preservation of our current energy use, but in you know, renewable form. And if we're not incredibly stupid or, you know, have really bad luck, we can avoid the crash scenario. So this means that we need to take seriously the idea of what's been called a long descent to a disciplined society where the discipline is not self-imposed, but is imposed by the, the access to energy that we have. And of course, this has implications for the sort of social complexity that's possible, that we might need to develop uh, at least more efficient forms and possibly simpler forms of, of human organisation. Now, some people say, oh, that's, that's terrible, that's going back to the Stone Age or the agrarian era, but this, this can be a creative descent. I mean, we have creativity, we have innovation, you know, we are adaptive. We are one of the most adaptive species around, that's why we're running the planet. So this doesn't necessarily need to be an awful regression to the agrarian era, but it might mean, hey, maybe it's time to scale back the amount of energy that you use. So um, I see these as you know, the, the, the sorts of scenarios that may lie ahead. Um, I'm neither an optimist nor a pessimist. Uh, I think we need to prepare for dissent, but I'm hoping that we won't need to go there. 
So with that in mind, if I ask the question, what lies beyond our global civilization in terms of the futures that lie there, we can do this in two ways. We can think about ourselves into the distant future, or we might be able to think of somewhere else, or someone else, or whatever the appropriate pronoun is for, a, for, a, for a, an alien life form. So we could use the, if we move outwards by one context from, from, from our special case of cosmic evolution to what might have occurred elsewhere, maybe we can probe the sort of astrobiology SETI realm for some insights um, as to that what may be coming. Um, the two main approaches to, to SETI uh, what, what you would probably think of as SETI, which is searching for, for radio signals, and this is generally known now as the orthodox approach, or the conventional approach. Uh, important name there is Frank Drake. David almost mentioned Drake's name in his talk, but there's, the equation was due to Frank Drake, and so he's, he's very well known in this. Uh, a complementary approach is the so-called Dysonian approach. This, and Dyson himself, Freeman Dyson at, at Princeton, said, forget about looking for signals, look for um, evidence of activity. Because they might not want to, you know, communicate. They might not feel that they need to bother. So look for artifacts or some sort of um, evidence of technical, signature, uh, technical products or other signatures of artificiality. Drake himself recently said that, you know, it's incredibly hard to think about the sorts of technologies that a very advanced civilization might develop. And in something that, that gladdens my heart as a futurist, he said, we have to become futurists, reaching far beyond our usual comfortable world of telescope technology to imagine um, possible scenarios for the distant future. And this may mean that we need to put on the preposterous future hat for a moment to really think outside the bounds of, of our immediate assumptions. Dyson himself said, there's a way to do this. And that is to think of the biggest possible artificial activities of which you can conceive, with limits set only by the laws of physics, and look for them. And the key point here is not ordinary or average forms of technology, but the most outlandishly, inconceivably vast and huge projects that would seem utterly preposterous to us. Good, I can help. Dyson himself famously um, came up with the idea that, that a, a civilization that's trying to, to harvest energy from its star would, would launch solar collectors and then more and then more and then more and in the asymptotic limit of time they, it would be completely enclosed by a swarm, as it was called, a Dyson swarm of collectors. So the star would disappear from visible view but you could still see it in the infrared. In other versions this is a solid sphere so you also see Dyson spheres or, or Dyson shells. Um, this led the, the um, astrophysicist Nikolai Kardashev to, to think that it might be possible to, to characterise technological civilizations on the basis of their energy use. So, in his view, the type 1 civilization uses the energy of a planet, something on the order of 10 to the power 16 watts, or you know, 10 petawatts. A type 2 civilization would access the energy of its star, 10 to the power 26 watts, which works out to be 100 yotta watts. But he also introduced this idea of a third level of a galaxy scale um, civilization, where the energy would be something on the order of 10 to the power 36 or even more watts. Now, unfortunately, as yet, in the scientific literature, there is no formal um, prefix for such a large number. So all we can really say is that this is a whole hell of a lot of yotta watts. <laughs> and it does prompt the question well, I wonder what a galaxy scale civilization would actually look like? Well, let's think. One possibility is that you have a type 2 civilization that uh, gets itchy pseudopods. They probably won't have feet. So they decide, oh, look, Zork, this star system is so five eons ago, we should go somewhere else. And so a vanguard are sent out to nearby stars. Uh, those are then converted, and then those send on more, and those send on more, and you get the idea this is a, a geometrically exponentiating process that over a relatively few uh, million years, actually, it's been modelled between 3 and 25, I think, that this could convert tens of billions of stars to this form, in which case they would disappear from, from the visible spectrum. A second alternative, which I actually think is much more fun, is if a, a species goes 
post-biological. What this means is that it's moved beyond its biological form, it's now transferred its intelligence to a sort of a technological or machine substrate, so it becomes effectively immortal as opposed to quasi-immortal. Um, it ends up having no need for Dyson style or Dyson sphere type habitats anymore. The habitat could actually shrink, habitat could shrink to the size of the individual entity itself. So they might decide to hang around the star and you know, absorb the energy, so you end up with, again, a sort of a Dyson swarm type of, of, of situation. Or they might decide, you know, Zork, I want to see the galaxy. So they decide, well, let's float freely through interstellar space and see what else this, this wonderful galaxy has to offer. So they could do this as long as they had access to energy. Now, if you go into interstellar space, you soon notice that the centre of the galaxy has lots and lots of yummy radiant energy that you could access to. The trouble is there's a lot of crud in the way that kind of absorbs and degrades that energy because it, it, it takes it from a high energy form and re it in a low energy form and it's, it's like, you know, like badly cooked food, I guess. It's not as, wouldn't, wouldn't be as nice. So the solution is just clear it out of the way. Or convert it into more of yourself. And you get the idea that that too would eventually be a, a geometrically exponentiating process. And so a very large volume of space might be cleared in this way over, you know, not even necessarily cosmological time frames, maybe even much so shorter than that. So what you might end up with is, beforehand you start off with a fairly typical barred spiral galaxy like the Milky Way is assumed to look like, and that sometime later it ends up looking like this. Now, in case you're wondering, no, this is not Photoshop. This is a real galaxy. Its name is Hoag's Object. Its principal galaxy's catalogue number is 54559, um, discovered in 1950. It's about 600 million light years away, roughly comparable to the size of the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, it has this beautiful core gap ring morphology. It's just lovely. As Clement will tell you, this is actually the, the wallpaper on my iPad. Um, and Arthur Hoag, who discovered this, called it a peculiar object, hence its name, Hoag's object, uh, thought it might have been an example of a gravitational lens as one of the sort of natural hypotheses or natural, uh, natural explanations for how this happened. Others have been proposed, it's a galaxy that's collide or that, you know, there's, there's two that are accreting or there's, there's various others. Um, and I say, well, that's nice, but what if? What if this is due to artificial activity? Hence the research question, Andrew, write this down. Is Hoag's object an example of galaxy scale macroengineering? Or in other words, is Hoag's object a Dysonian artifact? I think it would be a great deal of fun to figure out how you might prove this one way or the other. And I can think of at least four empirical observations that could be made to begin to answer it. And I think I don't have enough time to tell you, so you'll have to read it in the book chapter. Oh, no, no, all right, all right. So, for example, you look through the gap and what you do is you observe to see whether the, the electromagnetic spectrum coming through it from behind the galaxy has been altered in some way or is anomalous compared to what comes from behind the galaxy nearby. In other words, you're looking for differences with, for the radiation that comes through. Is there deep infrared? Is it scattered? Is there diffraction? Is it polarised? You know, are there any anomalies in there? Or you might look at the ring. If star material has been moved out of the, the inner part of the galaxy to the outer, then you might look for anomalies in the chemical composition of the ring compared to what you would expect to find in a typical galaxy with the normal processes of stellar evolution going on where heavier elements are built from, from hydrogen and helium. Or you might look and say, well, could there be a kind of timekeeping clock, a sort of you know, galactic mean time beacon at the centre of the galaxy. <clears throat> and that would be fairly clear. Why, why that might be there is that if you look carefully at the, and maybe you know, jump onto Google and get a better image of this, but inside the ring there is this, this braid of brighter stars that looks for all the world, well these are what star forming regions look like in galaxies, it looks for all the world like those star forming regions are synchronised in space. I wonder how that could be. And so Maybe, and this is the sort of, I put the ultra preposterous hat on now, say, 
if you're an immortal being with the prospect of immortality through the endless eons, maybe you want to do something. Maybe you produce an aesthetic effect. So maybe the braid in the ring is galaxy scale installation art. <laughs> hey, you've got to do something to while away the eons, don't you? Or maybe it's a way to signal other galaxies. Now what's not that clear in this picture is that right here, in the gap, there appears to be another example of precisely this kind of morphology. So check it out on Google. If nothing else, the idea gives us hope that maybe someone somewhere <laughs> has managed to survive long into their sort of post-Anthropocene analogue future. Um, to me, this represents a kind of a bullseye in the sky that says, you know, humans, if you get really serious about your long-term future, you could do something like this. So I think, you know, it couldn't hurt to take a closer look. I, I really, really hope the Square Kilometre Array or the Breakthrough Listen or Breakthrough Initiative has a, has a look. I don't think it would cost that much to do. If I do a cost-benefit analysis, I think the payoff would be huge, that for a relatively small amount of money, it might be literally an utterly priceless piece of information to possess that someone, somewhere, made it. And so my parting thought, because I'm out of time, is imagine our descendants, the deep posterity uh, whose fate lies in our keeping. Future big historians looking back to this epoch from the far or perhaps the very far future. What will they think of how we met the challenges of the Anthropocene and of the transition to Threshold 9? and beyond. I certainly hope that they'll approve of the choices we made. And I think the number one priority for our species and our civilization, barring everything else and with everything subordinated, is to make sure that we do all that we can do so that they can. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you.